Okay, this morning, as we begin to once again dive into God's Word, give you a little bit of background. Last week, we began a study we were calling uh, The Kingdom of God. And uh, as the church has been dispersed and unable to meet in, in normal ways, I believe that it's truly important for us to be able to expand our vision of what God is doing beyond the walls of the church. And one of the ways we do that is begin to look at the principles and the practices of, that are working God, in God's kingdom. So last week we began and we looked at uh, the beginning of the gospel uh, in Mark chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 9. And then today we want to begin to look at uh, Psalm 27. So if you have your Bibles, however you access that, we ask that you would have those open so that you'll be able to revert to them. And also while you're looking for Psalm 27, to kind of put your finger in there and then find Revelation chapter 4, because we'll be spending time there as well. Let us begin with the reading of the word of God in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though the war rise against me, yet will I be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. For you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I do seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. For you have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in the path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. Believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take tr courage. Wait for the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, as we now open this portion of your word, we as well open our hearts to you, our minds, our spirits to receive that which you desire to speak to us and among us. Lord, we give you liberty to move in us. And Father, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would expose those areas that have been hidden and need to be brought to light. And as well, that through your Holy Spirit you would give us a boldness and a power to step forward in the ways that you are calling us. May you find among us today people who have hearts that have been softened and have been surrendered to your will and your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a little bit of a background to give some context to Psalm 27. Actually, Psalms 26, 27, and 28 are meant to be read together. And the, the prominent piece in all those psalms is this idea of the place where, where people meet with God, whether it be the tent of meeting where God, Moses met with God in the Old Testament to the tabernacle, sort of the movable temple, to, to the actual temple that was established in, in Jerusalem. 
So in Psalm 26, this, this place where people meet with God is a place of scrutiny and confession. It's a place where God searches our hearts and calls us to move towards him. In Psalm 28, this place of meeting, this place where people meet with God is, is a place of prayer where people come and speak with God and, and God speaks with them. In Psalm 27, the psalm that I just read, there, there are these, part, these components of the psalm. It's that this place of meeting is, is an, a place of sanctuary from, from enemies. It's a, it's a place where we gain vision and perspective of who God is and what God is doing. And it's a place where the people of God meet God face to face. So that's the context of, of several thousand years ago when, the, when these psalms were written. But, but what, how does that translate to us as 21st century people who are seeking to be followers of Jesus? I want to begin with a, a little story that, that you may have heard previously, but it's a story of a French writer by the name of Jean Gino. He talks about hiking in the French Alps, and he's way out, and he's in this place that's just desolate. Uh, it's been, through careless deforestation, has just been left to become this dry, arid place where there is no life, there people aren't living. It's been abandoned. At one time, it was a place that flourished, but no longer. And he comes to the end of the day, and he comes across a, a shepherd's hut, and the shepherd invites him to come and to, to stay with him. After they have a meal, they're sitting by the fire, and the, the shepherd begins to count out acorns. And he watches him, the writer watches him do this. He, he counts out a hundred, and he inspects each acorn, uh, whether it be flawed or cracked or dried, and he picks 100 of the best acorns that he can, and then he sets them aside, and they go to bed for the evening. The next morning, uh, Jean Genel talks to the shepherd, and he said, what's this about? He said, well, he said, for, for the last uh, 13 years, I have been planting trees, planting these acorns. He said, over these years, I know I've, I've planted over 100,000 acorns. I also know that out of that 100,000, probably about 20,000 will actually sprout, and about uh, those 20,000, about 10,000 will survive and become thriving trees. The writer comes, goes back later, uh, right after World War I, and what he finds is that this place is beginning to be transformed. Where once it was completely devastated and barren, trees are beginning to, to grow. And as they grow, the ecology is beginning to grow. Streams that have once were dry begin now, have, are now flowing with water as forestation begins to spread. The writer goes back again, this time after World War II, and 20 miles from the site where he spent the evening with a shepherd, the whole place has been transformed. People have begun to move back. Their begin agriculture is beginning to thrive. And he writes this, Chanel reads, writes this. He says, On the site of the ruins that I had seen in 1913 now stand neat farms. The old streams fed by the rains and the snows that the forest conserves are flowing again. Little by little, the villages have been rebuilt. People from the plains where land is costly have settled here, bringing youth, motion, and the spirit of adventure. It has become a habitation where life abounds. I want to give credit where credit is due, and I'm indebted in some of these thoughts to two men, a, a father and son, uh, David and Leonard Ravenhill, who wrote extensively about revival and planted that seed in my in my head about this idea of this habitation where life abounds so this morning i want to be kind of focusing on this idea that of what as followers of jesus christ can we cultivate and maintain a place where god dwells richly in our lives 
Again, uh, so kind of a subtitle to the place where God dwells for the message this morning would be creating a habitation for God. But before we go any further, I want to explain a couple things. First of all, that the presence of God is in each follower of Jesus Christ. He or she who has committed their life to God is indwelled, according to God's word, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not come and go. He, he abides in every follower, regardless of the emotions we may have, the feelings that we might have, the circumstances, the struggles that we may be going through. He dwells within us. But we also know that there are times when we sense the presence of God more fully than at other times. And that as well, on the other side, there are times when we feel like our relationship with God is, is dry and, and barren. Sometimes we may even describe that as feeling like we've been uh, abandoned. It is not because God has actually done that, but it may well be that there are things in our lives that are inhibiting our relationship with God and he's using those emotions, those feelings to draw us back to himself. So what we're talking about is creating this habitation for God. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about anything other than creating an environment in our lives where God moves with freedom and has access to every aspect of our lives. Like, like the shepherd on, on, on that French Alp mountainside, planting and cultivating an environment where God's presence begins to thrive and grow and encompass us more fully. Speaking of Jesus, Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. And I'll be reading it from the King James Version because that version suits my purposes. <laughs> and speaking of Jesus, he says this, in whom ye have been built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The, the, the writer, uh, Dave, King David, in Psalm 51, puts it this way. He says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? And I believe that those kind of open up a really appropriate question for us. It's like, how can I, God, how can I live in the fullness of your presence that you have intended for me to live since before the creation of the world? And what are the things in my life that inhibit that fullness and what things in my life don't belong keeping that image of what the things don't belong in your your sanctuary sort of missions 101 tells us that when a missionary goes to a foreign culture one of the first things they do is they have to learn the etiquette of the culture that you're going into Different countries have different customs. And, and what is socially acceptable in, in one culture is an offense in, in another. Uh, an example might be you're the executive chef at, at the White House. And you have the ambassador from Israel coming to a state dinner. It's incumbent upon you to understand the dietary restrictions of the ambassador from Israel. You are not going to serve he or she a, a plate full of uh, pork chops and, and sausages because that's going to be incredibly offensive. So, so in the same way, we need to be sensitive to the environment around us in our lives that is conducive to this open and full relationship that God is calling us to and daily maintaining that environment with an attitude of the heart, with the thought patterns of our life, the activities that we, we engage in, the decisions that, that we make. So let's go back and take a look just quickly at that word habitation, because I think it unpacks it a bit for us. Uh, we might be able to guess 
if we had to come up with a definition, how would you define habitation? But, but strictly speaking, it's, it's kind of the, the region or the environment in which an animal or, or a plant naturally grows and thrives. It's a place where it's normally found and the surroundings. Um, probably the best thing I can think of is like a negative uh, example of this habitation, a natural habitation, and that would be a zoo. Not necessarily the zoos of today because they've regressed so much, but the zoos of, pre of past decades where animals were put in these concrete boxes with just steel bars. It was not in any way close to the natural habitation of those animals. So that's kind of the, the negative side of that. So let's take a look at the positive side of it. That word, we talked about the place where, where God meets with his people, and one of those places was the tabernacle. Now, the, the tabernacle, the Hebrew word for tabernacle is the word mishkan, and literally it means the residence, and it can mean like the lair of an animal, where an animal lives, a, a dwelling or even, even a tent. That word, that noun, is a different word as a verb, in Hebrew, and that's the word shakan, and that means to lodge, to reside, to abide, to dwell, to re remain, rest. So that when, when God speaks to Moses and tells him to, to build a tabernacle, and he gives him specific instructions, he's giving us this pictorial uh, image of the place where he dwells. It, it's a place that reflects the nature, the character, the activity uh, of God. Now, in the midst of these instructions about how to build a tabernacle, God declares this to Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verses, 28, uh, verses 8 and 9. And let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle, and of all of its furniture, so that you shall make it. The writer of Hebrews, later on in the New Testament, gives us even a fuller context of the purpose of these instructions on the tabernacle, but now moves it to the instructions to the priests of the permanent place, the temple. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, talking about the priests who served there, they serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect a tent, he was instructed by God, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So what does that, again, how does that translate for us in the 21st first century? Well, today we understand from, from the scriptures that God dwells in and among his people. Luke writes in, in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. The Apostle Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, and says this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? So because... God dwells within his people, our lives are to reflect his habitation. Where once it was the tent of meeting, the, the tabernacle, the temple that reflected the habitation of God, now we as his people and dwelled with his spirit reflect his habitation. The scriptures in a number of places give even more detail to, to this idea of the place where God dwells, his, his habitation. And one of the best pictures is that other scripture I told you about in Revelation chapter 4. So if you have that, you can turn with me there. As you're looking there, keep this in, keep this in mind, that when you visit a person's home, probably within 10 to 30 seconds after you walk in the door, you get a pretty clear picture of what's important to the people who live there by maybe the pictures on the wall, uh, where the TV is, 
how the furniture is placed, whether they have a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of clutter, or where they're living a minimalistic lifestyle. You learn a lot about the people who live in that home by looking at the home itself. So with that in mind, let's look at Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in, to heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with gold, golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was as if were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living like an ox, the third living creature like with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast down their crowns before his throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That is an incredibly rich passage that could take up an, uh, an awful lot of time to kind of unpack. But I want us to just think about a couple of images that come come through here in, the, in this picture. First of all, it's a place where God is king. It is his, his kingdom, and he rules, and he rules from the very central piece of furniture is, is the throne. That the picture is this, that God is the supreme ruler of both heaven and earth. He is king, and he alone deserves to be seated on that throne and not only that throne, the throne of, of our lives. He will not step down from it, step aside. He will not allow anyone or anything in our lives to supplant him from that throne. So that if we are going to cultivate this, this place where God dwells in freedom, that it must be this place where he is at the center of all things. That he has authority to rule and to reign, and we are actively submitting to his authority for his glory and for his honor. So his habitation is a place where he is at the center of our lives. Second of all, it's a place of holiness, verses 8 and 9. And the four living creatures, each of them has six wings and are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they never Cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So notice that it's a place where there is continual holiness, both, both day and night. So there's a certain a, a measure of, of holiness this morning in, in part of what we're doing. If we're, we're giving our attention, our focus to God, whether even in our homes as we worship and we enter into church in this kind of limited way. We, we, some of us 
do have our Bibles open are, and are actively looking at these scriptures where I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm using somewhat Christianese language to describe some of the things that I'm talking about. We're, we're focusing on, on spiritual thoughts. But in reality, we all know that this is just, at the most, it's, it's an hour. A and tomorrow morning, we're going to find ourselves someplace else. Never mind tomorrow morning, 20 minutes from now, we're going to be doing something else. And so the question is then, when we're away from this, then is it holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty day and, and night? I understand that our personal holiness is really only a, a reflection of the holiness, holiness of God. That somewhere, for, for some of us, we pick, picked up this mistaken idea that, that my holiness is merely the product of me doing holy things. That if I'm involved in, in those kinds of activities that I just outlined, then, then, I'm, hol then I'm holy because I'm doing holy things. I'm, I'm holy if I do this, and I'm holy if I don't do that. The list of, of do's and don'ts. Whereas Scripture tells us very, very clearly that whatever personal holiness that we possess is merely the result of our, us being in close proximity to God and reflecting His holiness, a place of His habitation where He dwells both day and night. So it's a place of where God is enthroned at the center of our lives. It's a, it's a place of of holiness, and it's as well a place of thanksgiving, verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory to God and thanks to him who's seated upon the throne, who lives forever and ever, in Psalm 100, and four, 100 verse 4, enter his courts with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So God dwells, his habitation is this place of of, of, of thanksgiving. There is this real richness of an appreciation of who God is and, and uh, uh, the resultant thanksgiving and joy that, that comes out of being with him. That in, in a very natural sense, think about the kind of people that you like to hang out with. Aren't they usually, do you like to hang around with people who are, who are constantly complaining, <laughs> complaining, who are just finding fault in anything that they can find fault in, and if they can't, they'll make something up. Are those the kind of people that we enjoy to spend, spending our time with? Or is it the ones who, when we spend time with them, we see reflected in them the spirit of, of joy and celebration for, for life, regardless of the circumstances, that they just find goodness in the life? Are not those the kind of people that bring bring life to us as we spend time there. So that is the same with this creating this habitation of God, this, this, this place of, of thanksgiving where there's, there's joy and celebration and the goodness and the love of God who is within us and close to us. And then fourthly, we see that the God's place, dwelling place is a place of worship, verses 10 and 11. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast down their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Sometimes we, we equate worship with singing songs, and that's the sum and substance of worship. But here we get this larger picture of worship that is this a life of constant reverence and a loving response to who God is and, and what he is doing. And that our response to what good God is doing is yes and amen, that we are in agreement with that which God is doing. Revelation chapter 5, verse 4. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So I may be going through a dry period. I may be going through a difficult time. I may be struggling and, and even practicing my, my disciplines of spending time with God, struggling in relationships 
with others. But we can know the goodness and the presence of God. And because of that, our response can be yes and amen to the work that God is doing. Now, I, I understand that even as I've shared these words today, that it can come across almost like a formula. I've, I've given you a definition. I've given you four points. I've given you a story. And the last thing I want to do is, is, is present a formula for having a deeper, fuller relationship with God. And first and foremost, I, I don't, because God doesn't work in formulas. There, are, there is no five easy steps to this. And also because when we try the formulas and they don't work, we end up getting discouraged. So I don't want to present a, a formula, but, but there are certain things to have a full and rich relationship with God that need to, to be pleasant. It, to be present, it needs, it's this place where God is indeed the, on the throne of our lives. It is a place where we reflect not some personal piety, but we reflect the very holiness of of God. It is a place of thanksgiving and gratitude and generosity because of who he is and what he does. And it is a place of worship. So I think that the point this morning for the message is really straightforward. That in the very natural, there is a correct habitat and environment that is vital for certain things to thrive. We know that orchids don't thrive at the North Pole and pineapples don't normally grow in, in Canada. And likewise, God does not, with freedom and blessing and, and favor and power, inhabit a place of rebellion and sin and ungratefulness and, and apathy. Our God is a sovereign God. We know that, that he can move and he does often move in, way, in ways that we don't understand, in ways that we don't have any control over. But there are certain things in our lives that we do and we can exercise control over. As we exercise discipline in our lives, we begin to create this atmosphere, this habitation where God can dwell, bringing a richness and an intimacy. So would that, that we would be able to take time to, to truly come apart by ourselves and spend time and allow God to examine our hearts, to see if there are, there are habits and activities and thoughts and relationships that are inhibiting our walk and our spiritual growth and maturity in him. In keeping with that agricultural theme, that, there may be, that might mean that it might involve some weeding, that there are some things that are in our lives that we have to just dig out from the root and pull out of our lives so that they no longer occupy space and energy and draw us away. It may mean that we need to plant new things. We may need to begin to do some things that we haven't done before to cultivate that relationship with God. And it may well mean that we do need to actually even do that, cultivate, add things into our lives that would take some things that are, are not flourishing and help them begin to grow and flourish. In the end, uh, I think that A.W. Tozer has just a, a great, memorable quote as a challenge and an exhortation to us. And he said this, we must learn to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Let's pray together. Lord God, you know that it is our heart's desire to have access to all that you offer to us as your children. And Lord God, that there are, we do have control and exercise in our lives that we can begin to draw close to you. We pray that you would show us those things, whether it be through study or prayer or service, worship. Recognizing, well, there may be things that need to be dug out of our lives we ask that you give us the boldness and the courage to engage in that and to lay aside the things that so easily entrap us and entangle us. And all of this, Lord God, not that we would have, again, an easier, just fuller life for ourselves, but that that would overflow and be an attraction to others, that we would have a life 
that reflects that flourishing and that that would be a natural draw to others. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord God, most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ who died for us that we may have life. It is our desire to be followers of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go.